Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Hazelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine, where we try to make keeping up with the literature as easy as possible for you. So let's do a quick pre-round summary of everything that we're going to be covering. First off, setting limits on your scream time during a concussion is pretty helpful. Second, handlebar mustaches are great. Welcome to Movember. Handlebar injuries are bad. Very bad. Then let's talk about POCUS. Nothing specific this time, just in general. After that, some antibodies for COVID, a treatment at last for those that don't stay in the hospital. And then from the fifth article, get to the chopper, the appropriate use of air ambulances. This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which this week were brought to you by the mature Jonathan Brewer, Sam Parnell, Aaron Lacey, and Clay Smith. All right, here's the first article. Effective screen time on recovery from concussion, a randomized clinical trial out of the JAMA Pediatrics. Welcome to the digital age, everybody, where now teens spend up to seven hours per day looking at screens. And I bet you adults can beat that figure no problem since a lot of us work in front of computers most of the day. When you get a concussion, you need to take a cognitive break. Give your mind some time to rest, especially for the first few days. I know that I currently advise my patients to avoid screens as much as possible during this period. Am I doing the right thing? This was an RCT of 125 children with concussions in the emergency department who were randomized to being told to have no screen time at all or use screens as they please for the first 48 hours after their emergency department visit. The discharge instructions were otherwise identical. Those told to abstain from screens used less screens, thankfully, only 130 minutes per day, and they recovered in the median time of 3.5 days. That's in contrast to the liberal screen use group that used screens 630 minutes per day and recovered in a median time of 8 days. These differences were statistically significant. Now, it wasn't a perfect study. This was self-reported data, so there's the risk of some recall bias. It also came from a single center, and it fell 15 patients short of their recruitment target, all because of COVID. Regardless, though, I think that more people could spend more time off their phones or in front of screens, and it's a pretty easy recommendation to make, which you could also couple with the advice to have some light aerobic exercise and their daily routines, which has been shown to help with concussions as well. In a spoonful, limiting screen use for the first 48 hours after a concussion diagnosis was associated with recovering almost five days faster, which was pretty much in half the time. Then we have the second article, titled Pediatric Handlebar Injuries More Than Meets the Abdomen, out of the journal Pediatric Emergency Care. Other than in cars, most kids are probably going to go fastest on their bikes. I know that was certainly the case for me when I was a kid, and I like going fast on bikes. Anyways, if you take all that kinetic energy and then concentrate it up into just the surface area of the end of your handlebars and you ram that into a kid, you're asking for trouble. This was a retrospective review of a single center trauma registry including 385 children with bicycle injuries, 107 of which involved handlebars. Now, as you might have expected from previous literature, the study showed that handlebar injuries, when compared to non-handlebar related injuries, were more likely, and I'm talking 10 times more likely here, to have both a solid organ or hollow viscous injuries. Handlebar injuries also have higher rates of soft tissue injuries like thigh, abdominal wall, or general lacerations requiring repairs. What handlebar injuries actually have less of are extremity, skull, spine, and CNS injuries. So all of this isn't going to change your assessment per se, but it's something to keep in mind. Those handlebar injuries can be bad. So even with a negative CT, if your exam isn't reassuring, then these kids might need a surgery consult and possibly admission, even with a negative CT, because they're at quite high risk. This was retrospective data though, so it's possible that some patients or injuries were missed, or that the exact details of the injury were not well documented for this analysis. In a spoonful, be very wary of intra-abdominal injuries in children with bicycle accidents where handlebars were involved. And then we have the third article titled Point of Care Ultrasonography out of the New England Journal of Medicine. So the New England Journal of Medicine reviews some of the trends and advances in POCUS, kind of a summary of the practice as a whole. So we're going to cover some of the key points from that review. POCUS decreases the number of formal ultrasounds that are necessary, which is great because I feel like they're a hot commodity, certainly where I work. And this can even reduce patient length of stay. There are some cases, though, where POCUS leads to more consultative ultrasounds, so there's some overlap, of course. In that vein, it's a great diagnostic tool. 
it saves your patient's radiation, and POCUS has been even shown to outperform chest x-rays and sometimes CTs for certain pathologies. And I don't need to tell you how much easier POCUS makes doing some procedures. Actually seeing onto the other side of the skin that you're poking needles through, oh my goodness, finding landmarks and actually seeing those landmarks properly, not just palpating some lumps, this is game changing. More than procedures and diagnostics, POCUS can also be used for monitoring, assessing respiratory failure over time, heart function, traumatic hemorrhage, or even shock. There's some controversy, of course, about its use in CPR, but it could get there as well. All that, and it's cost-effective. It's quick, it's easy, it's at the bedside. But really, we're just starting in the POCUS revolution. I fully expect to have maybe departmental stethoscopes that I borrow, and then individual ultrasounds that I wear around my neck by the end of my career. Focus can also be used to teach, it can be done remotely, and help with low resource settings. All that said, as frontline physicians, we love POCUS. And in a spoonful, I think POCUS loves us too. Then we have the fourth article titled Regen Cove, Antibody Combination and Outcomes in Outpatients with COVID-19 out of the New England Journal of Medicine. COVID-19 pandemic has affected more than 240 million people and caused the deaths of almost 5 million to date. Now, this is a little bit unrelated to this article, but I, and I don't want to belittle any of those numbers, but wow, guys, do you know how much worse this could have been? Please, please take this pandemic very seriously so that the next pandemic isn't going to completely decimate us. Anyways, the point of those numbers was to illustrate that most patients only get mild to moderately sick. We have dexamethasone for hospitalized patients, but what about almost everybody else? We did recently cover inhaled budesonide, but that's not likely necessarily going to be the big answer. This was a trial of Regen Cove, which I'm going to pronounce it that way because I don't know how else to say it. This was a combination of monoclonal antibodies, give me a second on the pronunciations here, casarivimab and imdevimab. These are antibodies directed against the spike protein of COVID-19. This trial was on outpatients positive for COVID-19 with risk factors for severe disease. They were then randomized to either Regen Cove or placebo. Finally, it's nice to see a trial where theory wins out. We've done a lot of things against the spike protein at this point and with antibodies, and in theory they should work great, but they haven't so far so well, but this was a positive study. Both the 2400 mg and 1200 mg doses showed a 70% relative risk reduction in COVID-19 related hospitalizations or deaths. The Regen Cove group also recovered 4 days faster than the placebo group, 10 days instead of 14 days. Benefits were even present in patients with pre-existing seropositivity for COVID, which is good because I'm hoping most people will be vaccinated soon. It's also quite safe. There were more adverse events in the placebo group, and even then, less than 0.3% of patients had a grade 2 or higher infusion-related reaction. Limitations of this study are that it was conducted by the people that own this drug. Now, that doesn't mean the data is false, it just means that we have to be careful. Also, even though they included death in their composite outcome, the study was not powered enough to detect a difference in mortality. There's only 5 deaths actually occurring in the entire study, so that's not a lot to comment on that, but it did certainly then reduce hospitalizations, if not to death so much. In a spoonful, Regen Cove, a combination of monoclonal antibodies against COVID-19, was associated with a shorter symptom duration and the lower risk of hospitalization or death from COVID-19. And following that, we have the last article titled, Appropriate Air Medicine Services Utilization and Recommendations for Integration of Air Medical Services Resources in the EMS System of Care, a Joint Position Statement and Resource Document of NAEMSP, ASAP, and AMPA, out of the Journal of Pre-Hospital Emergency Care. That was a painful article title to read. Anyways, the ultimate in cool for EMS is probably air ambulances. They can be life-saving, but they're also extremely expensive, and they can even be dangerous. Don't forget about Kobe Bryant, air travel is not always safe. Here we have a position statement on air ambulance use from several associations that we trust. When are air ambulances useful? Honestly, they have a niche. They should be used to facilitate advanced care, which would not otherwise be possible, providing time-sensitive transport for serious conditions and from locations otherwise difficult to access. 
Now, going up in the air takes more planning than just taking your car out of park. You have to consider that these are potentially dangerous machines requiring highly trained pilots. Consider their safety every time you make a call for an air ambulance. Which is part of considering that your patient safety, since if anything happens to them, that same thing's probably going to happen to your patient too. This means not shopping around. If you've been declined by one agency for safety concerns, don't call every other air ambulance service. That's just bad. Ideally, requests should be routed through a central service so that everyone's on the same page. If that's not the case, try to be respectful of the teams with expertise in a domain that you likely know relatively little about. If they say it's not safe, it's not safe. These services can do amazing things, saving lives, but trust the air ambulance teams to know their work. In a spoonful, air ambulances have a time and a place, but keep in mind that the only priority that you should put before your patient might be your team. Include air EMS services in that team. And let's do a wrap up because I love the wrap up. First off, we saw that concussions are a good reason to do a 48 hour screen time detox, which could shorten your recovery by five days. Then second, look ma, no hands. Yeah, yeah, it's all fun and games until you get a handlebar in the abdomen or elsewhere, which this study showed to be more likely to cause intra-abdominal injuries than when no handlebars were involved. From the third article, give a little bit of appreciation for where POCUS is now and acknowledge where it's going. Then fourth, we might have actually found something to give our higher risk outpatients. It's called Regen Cove. It's antibodies against the spike protein. It reduced symptom duration and lowered rates of hospitalization and death. I won't harbor a guess as to, you know, how much it costs or if that's cost effective, but mild COVID is certainly a juicy target for pharma companies right now. Then from the last article, air ambulances can do amazing things, bringing life-saving care to situations and locations otherwise unreachable. Now then, you've earned them what we offer them, CME credits provided through a partnership with Hippo Education. All the details for that are at our website at journalfeed.org, where in the very same place you can sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to, and then you can get daily spoon feeds through your email every day of the week. Our goal here at the Journal Feed is to provide better patient care through spoon feeding, and so we're trying to help you keep up with the latest research one spoonful at a time. Thank you. <laughs>